All right, squad, today I'm gonna to run you through something pretty cool, which is setting up Next.js app and a Rails API so that they can talk together and you can grab data from the API and display it in Next.js using Tanstack query. I'm gonna step you through setting up the Next.js app, a new Rails app in API mode and show you how to connect the two. And if you hang around to the end of the video, I'm gonna show you a special little trick on how you can use types across both. We're gonna create a super cool Next.js front end pulling in data from a Rails API, which is running on port 3002. So you can see there's just three names here, three names here. And if we go into Rails and we add another user called Zimmy, old mate Zimmy Z, right there. Chuck it in there, just so you can see I'm not lying. Refreshes from Rails. So let's jump in and see how we do it. All right, first things first, let's create a directory. So what, because what we're going to do here is we're basically going to create a mono repo in of sorts. It's not exactly a mono repo, but we're going to store all the code in a single folder, a mono repo. So let's go for that. So what we're going to do here first is we're going to go, so I'm in my code directory and I'm going to just go make the, also I'm in Mac. So if you're in Windows, it'll be slightly Different. But let's get started. So first we're gonna go to the uh, directory. So we're gonna go uh, Next.js Rails, right? So we, that's what we're gonna call my project. You'd name that whatever your project's going to be. And then we're gonna just jump into that, right? So we're gonna just jump in there, okay? Created the directory. What we wanna do is we're gonna create a new Next.js app. So to do that, we're gonna go in, create next app at latest, right? Hit that. Now that's gonna grab it. And now it's gonna ask us what we're gonna name it. So we, this is what we're gonna name the Next.js project within our Next.js Rails directory. So what I've decided to do here is I'm gonna call this front end, right? Do we wanna use TypeScript? For sure, ESLint, you betcha, and Tailwind. Source directory, yes. And the app router, all right, just to keep this modern, yes. Uh, do we wanna customize the default import alias? No, at slash is fine for us. All right, so now it's just gonna initialize directory and pull in all the dependencies. So we'll let that do its thing. Okay, so once we've pulled in everything ready to go, we are now got our folder. So what we can do here is we're gonna jump into that folder. We're gonna go CD front end and we can now go NPM run dev, okay? So that's gonna start up our server right here at HTTP semicolon slash slash localhost 3000. Okay, so now that that's running on localhost 3000, what we're gonna do is we're gonna grab a new browser window and we're just chuck that in and just make sure it's all running, right? So there we go. You would have seen this guy before if you've used next. And that's just our starting blank page right there, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go jump back one directory into our Next.js Rails project and I'm gonna open up code, VS Code in that directory. So now what you can see here is we have our front end folder, which is our Next.js project. And then we've got our source and then we've got our page, right? So this is running this guy here. So we got that all set up, all working. Let's move on to the next step. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna install Tanstack Query. And if you don't already know, Tanstack Query or formerly React Query won the query library because it handles all the complex pieces of data fetching seamlessly. Let's install it and you can see what I mean. So to quickly see what I'm talking about is if we go to Tanstack, query, you can have a quick read here. This is the Tanstack library, powerful asynchronous state management, TypeScript, JavaScript, React, Solid, Vue, Svelte, and Angular. So this was called React Query and you definitely would have heard about it before, but this is now Tanstack. So let's install that into our project. So what we're gonna do here is get into that folder. Okay, so now we're in the, and it's gonna be at Tanstack slash React Query. So it's still called React Query in the, as a library. There we go. Done. Tanstack Query, or React Query right there. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to set up the query client component inside the directory. The next piece of the puzzle is setting up the query client component inside of our Next.js project. So we're going to create a new directory and that's going to be called components. So we're going to go components. And then inside of that, we're going to have a new file inside of React Query client provider, and then we're gonna have an index or TSX in there, right? So what that's done there is just created another directory and then a file called index here. So what we wanna do here now is we wanna use, this is gonna be a use client, because this is gonna use some hooks that we need to run. It's gonna use the use state hook. So we need to call this to make sure that it works. Firstly, we're gonna go import query client from Tanstack React Query. We also need the query client 
provider. Okay, so we need those two things there. Then we're gonna go import use state and that's gonna come straight from React. Okay, I'm gonna pull that to the top. I like to import React things first. We got some formatting stuff here, but that's fine. Okay, we're gonna export our default component from here. So we're gonna go export const and this is gonna be called React query client provider, right? And it's got its props here and then we're gonna open it up. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go type and then this will be props and then it's just literally children and it's a react.react .react node, all right? And then I just like to do a lot of this. You could do this in line, but I prefer to define types up here and then define them here, okay? So now what we have is we're going to set up our query client and we're gonna do that with use state and that's gonna be a new function and that's gonna return a new query client from Tanstack. We're gonna open that up and pass in some options. Now we're gonna go default options. We're gonna open that up and we're gonna have queries, open that up. And then we're gonna have stale time is 60 times 1000. So this is in milliseconds. And the reason is we want to set a default stale time above zero when using SSR to avoid refetching immediately on the client. Okay, so we don't want the data to be say it's stale straight away. We wanna have a bit of a delay there. So that looks like that's set up. And now what we're gonna do outside of in our React component is we're actually return a query client provider. And we're gonna set the client to our query client, okay? And then inside here, we're gonna wrap all our children. That gets passed in here, okay? And we just have to define our children. So we're gonna get our children from our props. So it's gonna be children equals props. So that's destructured there and away you go. All right, so we can move on to the next step. So from here, we now need to wrap our app with our query client provider. Okay, so to do that, we're gonna jump into the layout and this is the default layout. So we just check here and what we wanna do is import, whoops, react query client provider. And you can see it's all done it for us at components, react query client provider, that's the guy. And we wanna wrap all of this in there. All right, so now everything inside here will have be passed through the context of this guy here. Okay, so that's pretty much it for there. All right, so now we can move on and set up our HTTP client. So I like to use Axios for this guy. So we're gonna use Axios as our HTTP client. So let me just jump on here. So if you have a look at Axios, it's right here. It's the promise-based HTTP client. And this is it here, all right? So pretty, it's, it's pretty well maintained and you can read more about it here, but we're gonna install it now into our application. So to do that, we're gonna open up our console again. We're gonna go npm i axios. You can use i instead of install, they are interchangeable, all right? So that's the same thing. We're gonna run that and now we can double check it all worked. Jump to our package, check that axios is there. So now this next piece is setting up the API. I like to define the API in a single place so that we can access it very easily and it's not spattered across the whole app. To do that, we're gonna go into, and we're gonna create a new file. So it's gonna be API, it's gonna be the directory, and then it's gonna have base url.ts, okay? So what we're doing here is we're defining our base URL. So when you're working on a production app, you're, you're gonna have a development environment, you're gonna have, probably have a, some sort of staging or stage environment, and then a production environment, okay? So you'll have different URLs when we're using our front end here. Okay, so to do that, we're gonna go const base URLs equals, and we're gonna open up an object. Then we're gonna go development, right? And then we're gonna have staging, production, and then test. I like to have a test one there too sometimes. At the moment, we don't have staging production or we're not doing testing. So we're just gonna define our local host, right? So it's gonna be local host, and we're gonna use port 302 for our Rails API, and we're gonna use the V1. So I'm gonna show you in this video also how to namespace or version our API so that you can make changes and not break clients that are using your old ones. So if you built a front end using V1 and then you go and you make a V2 API, you're not breaking all the V1 clients, okay? So with that set up, now what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say const base URL is equal to base URLs. And then we're gonna use the node environment here, dot end, dot node end. Right, so that'll that'll be development, staging, production, or whatever, and we're going to default that or fall back to. Sorry, it's in here. We're going to fall back to here to development. 
okay? So if we haven't got a node in, we're gonna use development. And then we're gonna go export default base URL, okay? All good, that's that one, okay? So that's now our base URL. Next up, we're gonna create the API and we're gonna go here, new file, and it's gonna be index.ts. So this is gonna be our index for our API. So whenever we call the API, it's gonna export from here all the different endpoints that we have access to. So let's set this file up now. So the first things first inside of this index file is we're gonna go import Axios, all right? There we go, got him. We're gonna import our base URL, because we need that to work with. And now we're gonna create an instance of Axios. So we're gonna just call this instance equals Axios dot create and we're going to open it up and we're going to give it some options so we're going to go it's going to pass in the base url and then we're going to have a timeout here all right we're going to set it a second second timeout so what's this guy crying about can't do you mean base url yep so let's just double check that what does axios want here okay so we just need to make sure that this is called base url here because axios expects it to look like that Okay, so we got that there. And now what we wanna do is we're gonna say type API options. And here we're gonna say what options are we allowed to pass in here. So we're gonna say data, method, and we're gonna have get, we're gonna have put, we're gonna have post, and we're gonna also have delete. And then we're gonna have params, and that can be an object, okay? Now down the bottom here, we're gonna actually export our API method. So from here, we're gonna go export const API equals async. So it's an async method and it's gonna get the URL, which is a string and it's gonna get the options, which is API options or an empty object. And then we're gonna just create a new function here, okay? So the first thing is we're gonna destructure. So we're gonna get our, get our params. So we're gonna go data, method, and we're gonna default that to get. So you don't have to always pass it in. And we're gonna pass in the params here and we get that out of options. Next, we're gonna get our access token. Now, this piece is gonna be hard coded for now because I'm not gonna cover authenticating a API endpoint in this video, but I do have a video on my channel. So if you just have a look up and we'll see if we can link that for you to where you can use a JWT to secure your API endpoints, all right? So in that instance, you would get your JWT to have defined that, and then you're gonna just be passing it in. But I'm just using a hard-coded one for now, just to keep it simple. Otherwise, this video will turn into hours. So let's go here. So we're gonna go catch error. So what we're doing here is we're just doing setting up a try catch. So we're gonna try to do this method. If something breaks or fails, we're just gonna throw a new error here, okay? So we're gonna go error.response data.errors. So we're just gonna try catch that if we can, okay? We're gonna get a type error, but we won't worry about that right now. So what we're gonna do is our response is gonna look like this. It's gonna await instance. So what we could do here just to be clear is we're gonna call this Axios instance, right? Because then it just makes it, it's good to name things well. And then we're gonna make a request and we're gonna pass in our request options. All right, so for our request options, first up we've got our data. So that's what we're gonna send through. Now we've got our headers. Now this is important for your authorization, right? So this is what I said we're not covering today, but I'm still gonna show you the, how you pass it through. So we're gonna pass in bearer and then we're gonna have our access token. So this is assuming you're using a JWT, okay? So that's how you do that there. Then we're gonna pass through our method. Then we're gonna have our params. So these think of these as query params. Then you're gonna have your response type. So we're wanting JSON back here and we are gonna have our URL. All right, so that's what we're gonna do with our request. And this is our response object here. Now that is going to return. And then what we wanna do here is we wanna return response.data, okay? Now down the bottom of this file, we're gonna export this as our default and we're gonna export API, okay? So this is our API now. So now we can pass through different data method params URL and it will make the query to our Rails API and return our data for us. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up a router. So this is a kind of a little bit of a new convention that I like to use when working with an external API is just setting up like a little router file so you can auto complete through. So you can go like a API and then you can go dot user dot get users instead of actually having to define the method every time. So I'll show you how to do that. So we're gonna jump into API and we're gonna create a new file called router. 
I don't know why VS Code does that to me. Router.ts, okay. Now we are going to import user endpoints from user. And this file doesn't exist yet, but you'll see in a second what I'm doing. So we're gonna go endpoints here is equal to users and that's going to be the users endpoints right there and then we're going to just export default endpoints so you can kind of see what i'm doing here i am going to have an object called endpoints which gets exported from router so basically you're going to import api router and then you're going to go api router dot users dot get users so it just makes keeps all of our api endpoints here so you go into this these files once and i like to keep them organized by model right? So user, project, campaign, et cetera, et cetera. So next up, let's create the actual user endpoints. So we're going to have user.ts here. Now we're going to go import API from index. Now we're going to say const endpoints again. So these are all the user endpoints. And now what we're going to have is going to have get users, right? So that's going to be our endpoints. Then we're going to have async. It's an async method, not taking any params in right now and we're going to say here return await api users right so this is the endpoint that we're going to be calling we're going to pass it through the url sorry to the api so it'll be api v1 slash users right and this is just awaiting now if you wanted to pass anything through here you could put options in and then you could pass them through but this is a very simple one for now we're not actually passing any params through i'm just kind of showing you how you set this up so we go default endpoints like that all right and now this guy if we close it and open it again I cannot find mute user it's right there chief so that's just crying because we created it in the wrong order okay let's close that and we can close that. So now we've got our API set up in Next to make the calls to our Rails API. But we now need to set up the Rails API so that we can actually return some data. So let's jump in and do that. Let's get Rails installed. So I'm in the front end directory here. I'm gonna open a new tab in my terminal. I'm gonna go CD back, okay? So now I'm in the Next.js Rails project. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new Rails backend. So I am assuming that you have installed Rails and Ruby before. If you haven't, go watch a video on how to do that. But I have done all those things. So I have Rails working. So now all I need to do is create a new project. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to go Rails new backend. So this is the project name. So similar to Next.js, we called it frontend. Here we're calling it backend. And then what we're going to do is we're going to pass through the flag called API. All right. So this sets Rails to API mode. So it drops off a whole bunch of things. So it makes it load actually a little bit faster, but it does lose a bit of functionality. So there are modules that you may add back in later if you need them. But for now, we're good to run just API. So I'm gonna just get enter on that guy and it's gonna do all this thing. Similar to next, it's gonna go and grab all the gems and initialize and that's it, done. So now what we can do is we can go here, we can actually go list and you can see there's a back end and a front end. So if we now jump into VS Code, we can minimize our front end and open up a back end and here's your Rails project. So now what we wanna do is we wanna set our port to 3002 because we want to, Rails by default also runs on port 3000, that's a collision. So we need our, when we're working in dev, to have different ports so they can talk to each other. Okay, so where do we go? So we go back end, we go config, we go Puma. All right, so Puma is the web server that um, serves up our Rails application. But all we're really concerned with here is finding the port. So you can see it over here. And we want that to be 3002, okay? So that's it there, 3002, okay? So now what we can do is move on to install JBuilder. So what is JBuilder? JBuilder is a tool that we can use to build JSON APIs with Ruby. So it's a way you can easily define out your, what you want to return in your JSON. So all to, to do that, we just actually literally have to uncomment this line in our gem file, which is here, gem file. All right, I might just make this a little bit bigger so everyone can see that. So we've got JBuilder here. Now to do that, we've uncommented. Now we can jump back into this guy here, CD into backend, and we're just gonna go bundle. And that's gonna run and go and fetch that and install it. Okay, so that now JBuilder is installed. In this project, we are using SQLite here, but that's just, in real apps, you probably wanna use something like Postgres or something, but I'm just using this because it's not, it's outside of the scope of this project. But what we can do now is we can boot this up, we're gonna go Rails S, all right, and see what happens. Now it says it's running on 3002. 
can see it there. We can open this up here and we can go localhost 3002. There you go, we're running. So we're installed and we are ready to go. Now I'm gonna show you some of the power of Rails. First things first, control C, close that down, clear that window. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go Rails G scaffold user. So what we're doing here is we are creating the user model. So we want, what Rails will do here with this is we'll create the model, we'll create the controller, create the JSON views that we need um, all in one. Let me show you, hit enter, here we go. So we've got our migration. So that's gonna create the migration to create that table in the database. It's gonna create the model, the tests we need. It's gonna create a route. It's gonna create a controller and it's gonna create all the J builder views. So index, show, and then the partial, all right? So now what we can do is we can go into our migrations file. If I just find that, so it's in backend, db, migrate, and there you go. It's got a timestamp. So here we can see we're using active record to create a new, we're gonna change the database. I'm gonna create a table called users. And then it's saying do T. So T is the table and we're gonna say here, we want a table column named string and we're gonna call it name. And we're gonna have another string column and we're gonna have it as email. Very simple for now. We're not creating something crazy. So we've done that. And now we can go back into our backend here in the console and go rails db migrate run it all right so that's now migrating the users and it's created a table called users okay so now what we can do is if we run rails c which is rails console basically runs a whole app inside a terminal so we have access to everything we can go in here and go user dot all and you can see what it runs a sql and it's like no there's nothing there chief so let's add one so we're gonna go user dot create and we're gonna go name ken grief and then we're gonna have email is ken at email.com and hit boom there we go so you can see it's inserting into the users and it's created a new ken grief and it's returned the actual model for us okay very simple now if we go in here and we restart the rails server with rails s and then we can go here and we can go to users.json there we go so you can see that we already have an api running how long did that take not even two minutes and we have a full, that's the API endpoint, obviously unauthenticated, so anyone can access this data. So it's a public API, which is fine for now, because I'm just showing you how to do it. But we would want to lock this down, right? So you want someone to be authenticated. And there we go. That's where the path is and the ID. But you can see we not don't have name and email. Okay, so what we need to do to fix that is actually go in and update our view. So to do that, we're going to go into app, views, users, user. So this is a partial. So I'll quickly show, explain to you what that is. So in Rails, we have this index file. So what it's saying is using JBuilder, we're gonna create an array of users. So what is the users being passed down? So I'll show you how this flow works. If we jump into users controller, we'll see we have an index route and it's defining users as user.all. So it's saying all the user models, there's no scoping, there's no authentication, it's just every single user we have, no limits. Then we're passing that at, so you can see this instance variable here, it's being passed down to the view. And then we're gonna render and loop through the partial users user as user. So it's basically saying define every instant item in this loop, call it user and pass it into this partial, okay? This partial, which is underscore user in Rails is underscore user. We're now gonna say from the user variable, right? That variable there, grab the ID, create it, update it at, and then also we're gonna create a custom field here called user user and we're gonna use this helper to get the URL of the user, okay? So what we wanna do here is we're going to just change this slightly so we can get more fields. I like to format it this way, just makes it easier to sort and know what's going on. So we're gonna go in here and we're gonna have email and name. And we're gonna just hit a sort on that guy, bang. I like to have ID at the top though. Okay, so I usually have ID at the top and then I sort the rest of them down. And then that's that. Now, if we refresh this guy, you can now see email and name. And that's how easy it is to change that view or what we're returning. So now we've got our views rendering what we would need and we can move on. So I promised you that I'd show you how to version your API. So let's do that. So I'm gonna go in here, command KW, shut that down. So we're gonna namespace this. Now, again, I'll touch on this again, but it's just, it's important to namespace your API so that if you create a V1 API, 
and you have clients building off of it. it could be your own clients it could be external clients but then you decide oh we're going to restructure this whole thing we're going to change our authentication mechanism or we're going to change what we return in the shape to be more efficient or it's cached or something if you want to be able to do these changes without breaking clients you want to maybe introduce a v2 or a v3 it depends how long you've been doing this game but in my last business we already had we're up to v3 okay we changed our api th three times so this is really important and it's a very good thing to do now rather than try and do it later so we're going to do it right from the beginning so we're going to go into backend app controllers and then we're going to create a new folder called api controller so we're going here and we're going to go v1 slash api controller.rb okay so we've got controllers v1 api controller all right now in ruby whenever we go into a folder we are going down and we're going to create a module right so it's saying i'm inside of the v1 and then i'm going to have class api controller okay and that is going to inherit from application controller so anything app wide we want to set into application controller but usually in an api like this we'll probably define any kind of authentication behavior inside of api controller rather than application controller because like i said if you change your authentication mechanism between v1 and 2 it's in it's controlled in here it's not living up at the application controller so only really app wide things go in your application controller now that we got that done what we want to do here is pull in our users controller into our v1 directory yes we want to move it and we're going to have to update it now so we want to because we've moved it inside v1 we need it now need to namespace it as well so we're going to say here module v1 we're going to grab all of this class and we're going to just tab it in once and finish it off like that all right so now we're in v1 users controller but what we need to do now instead of inheriting from application controller we want to inherit from api controller okay so now users controller inherits from this file and then this file inherits from this file, okay? And then you can see right at the top, it all inherits from application, oh sorry, action controller API. The next step with our versioning to make our versioning all work is we're gonna open up our routes.rb. So these are all the routes. So you can see there's our users uh, route that was created. But what we need to do down here is I'm just gonna move it in here and I am going to now set. So we're gonna set a namespace and we're going to call it v1 we're going to set the defaults for this namespace so for as default we are going to return json from here and then we're going to open that up and say do so anything inside the v1 namespace in the route will now be there and we're going to pull users up into that we can check what that all did so let's just control c our api here we're going to go rails routes another cool little tool it's going to show us all the routes we have okay so let me just make that a bit bigger but what we are concerned with is this user's endpoint here. Does this go all the way? So what you can see here is we have, unfortunately my terminal's a little bit too zoomed in, but we have our V1 user's endpoint and you can see that it goes there. So it goes V1 users, all right? So now if we refresh this guy, we need to, rest we need to start the server first. So if we go Rails S, you'll see there's a big error right no nothing matches because we've moved it if we go v1 users we've got an uninitialized constant error why is that happening so let me explain so what we have here is we have api controller but these are all capital letters as a convention when rails is looking up these files it's going to be looking for the capital letter of each thing so users controller it's going to look for users controller like that now api controller will actually be api controller like that right so it's going to be looking for this now this is called an inflection because we actually want to know this is an acronym so we don't really want it to write it like this we want i like to write it as it properly is an api so to we can fix that in rails by fixing our inflections so to do that we're going to jump into i'm just going to close this go to back end we're going to go to config initializes inflections right so you can see here these inflections rules so here's a rule that it comes by default like restful because restful needs to be in capitals but so what we're going to do is we're going to say we want to inflect flect the acronym api okay so rails has that built in for us now if we just control c rails s 
Now let's see if that worked. What are we looking for? No template found. Okay, so there's no template found. So we've now got a different error. So we need to now move. Where are we? Let's open up code. We need to jump back into the back end. Now it's looking for if Rails is actually telling you no template found for V1. So what it's doing is looking inside of the folder, but it, there is none there. So I'll show you app views. Now it's looking for views V1 users. So if we create a new folder here called V1 and chuck users inside there. We just have to fix a couple of things. So we need to go users. I think it has to be v1 users user and v1 users user. And let's have a quick look. Oh, we also need to fix. There's another thing that we need to do. We need to fix this v1 user URL. Okay, let's see if that works. There we go. All right, we're back on. So now you can see we've got a v1 namespaced route here. And you can see we're returning the thing and then saying the URL for this user is that. Let's see if that works. There it is. So now see we've got the URL for the individual user. You can see it's not an array anymore. It's probably pretty small for everyone, but it's not an array. It's just a single object and it's telling you its URL is there. Cool. Very simple. So we've now gone through, we've set up our Rails API very simply, no authentication, no policy scoping, very simple, but we're returning a user from our V1 API. You can now later on go create V2, V3, and be know that you're not gonna break anything. So you've got backwards compatibility, which is great. But now what we wanna do is we wanna actually go and display this data in the front end. So let's jump back into next and do that. All right, so now we've set up the Rails API and it's all returning with namespace URL. So we've got V1, we can have V2, we can do whatever we need to do and we've got, we can maintain backwards compatibility. But now what we wanna do is we wanna actually go and grab that data and display it on our front end. So let's go and do that. We'll jump back into next. So now what we wanna do is we wanna show and actually render these results in the front end. So we're gonna go back into the front end directory here. We're gonna to go to source, we're gonna to go to app and then we're gonna to go to page, right? So this is a page that I showed you before. Let me just shrink this old mate so we can actually see what we're doing. We got this guy here and we got this guy. All right, so that's the page. What we wanna do is jump in here. I want to go to this and I really just wanna get rid of everything that's in here because we don't need all this nonce. We're gonna do a very simple thing. And we're just gonna say, hello, I don't need next image. And then let's just go there, we got hello, boom. Done, finished. See you guys next on the next one. Now let's keep going. Here what we need to do is we're gonna go import query. So we're gonna go import use query from Tanstack React Query. And we also wanna import our API router. So we're gonna go API router from, and here this is at API slash router. Okay, that's there. And I think this is gonna crash because it might need to use client. That seems I haven't declared yet. I just think it's gonna use the use client, but we'll keep going and see what happens. So now we wanna actually get the data. Okay, so what we're gonna say here is we're gonna go const data is equal to use query. So that's now Tansac query. Now we're gonna give it a query key. So we're gonna call this one get users. So you would define this if you're passing different options, if you had like filters or something, you'd pass it into the query key so it's unique. But again, ours is very simple right now. And here, I'm just gonna split this down so it's easy to see what I'm doing. And here you're gonna see API router dot. See how it's auto-completing for us? We got users. So it's, just, it's acting like something you'd see in TRPC users dot and then this would be get users now i don't think i've actually set up my types properly so i'm not getting this next one but i'll show you the reason being is because we haven't actually defined the types but i'll show you how we can define types here so let's just go have a look at what's going on because it's actually saying there's a problem so if we go to users get users what are you saying use query is not a function that's interesting why are you doing that to me let's see if i add in here use client okay yeah, it needs to be using use client there okay so we haven't defined any types here right so it doesn't know what's coming through but that's all right we'll fix that later so it fully auto completes now what we can do here is we can actually go and just quickly sanity check i like to do that we're going to go console.log data we're going to run that and then we're going to go here open up inspect what's going on awesome so we've got a cross origin failure because we're coming from 3000 and going to 3002, those aren't the same origins, so we need to define that. So let's go and fix that quickly. So to do that, how do we fix a cross origin request resource sharing, I should say, cross origin resource sharing. To do that, we're gonna jump into our gem file and Rails has this here, 
rack cores, all right? We wanna enable cross-origin resource sharing or cores. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into config, initializes, cores, it's all set up for us already. We're gonna uncomment this, okay? We wanna allow origins of all for now. Now with an API, you probably do allow that, but you can lock this down. If you, you have a private API, you can lock it down to your domain name only or your subdomain, so where you're hosting your front end, so that you don't have, you know, you do block it if someone else is using it on a different front end. So you can do that, you can lock it down. But right now, this will do for us. And we are going to now close and restart Rails and let's see what we get. So that big error is gone. And now we've got it getting some data. Boom, you can see it right there, okay? So now we're talking to our Rails app and we're getting our data from the API. Let's just quickly go and actually loop through this and show it in our front end. So I'm gonna create just a list. And then from here, I'm gonna go data.map. So let's just make sure we have data there because we don't know if it's set or not. I'm gonna pass a user and then we're just gonna render out a new list item with a key user.id and then we're going to have user.name and then just user.email okay let's see there we go we're on so that's it we're getting data straight from our rails api it's almost it almost feels instant so we've done that and there we have it that's what i promised you in the video to set up a rails api and then going to use next.js slash react to fetch data from that api and display it and there we go we have it on the screen all working but i can't just leave you there because i know that you like your types you like using TypeScript. So let's see how we can actually add some sort of types into from our Rails API so that we get things like, what does the user model look like? So we can expose the name, email. It's very basic types, but it does help just define those models out. So let's jump in and do that. So there are a few different ways of adding types into a Rails API. There's one that I really like where you can use RSpec to run the tests and actually generate types for each endpoint, which is way more powerful, I think, because you get it per endpoint. But what I'm gonna do today is just generate types for the model schema so that you know what a user looks like, what a project looks like, etc. All right, so to start, we are going to add a new gem. So we're gonna go run bundle add. So make sure you're in the backend directory here. I'm gonna go bundle add TS underscore schema, okay? And this is a cool gem. It just looks at the DB, basically the state. So let me just show you what it's gonna look at. It's gonna go database schema. It's gonna look at this right and from there it's going to generate the, the schema so what we want to do here is first we're going to run rails generate ts schema install okay and that's going to create this initializer for us right so a lot of things are done in the rails initializers here there's ts schema so you've got a whole bunch of options that how you can define how this works and runs but what we're gonna care about here is the output, right? So where does this file actually get generated? So what I wanna do is I wanna just have this go straight to a file called api schema.d.ts inside of the Rails root. And then what I want is the namespace. So let's look for that namespace. Namespace, if you can spell name, there's the namespace. And I want this to be called api schema for the namespace and then the schema type, I like to have type instead of an interface. So that's cool. Now what we can do once we've done that, we're gonna go rails schema generate, okay? So the cool thing about this gem as well is it will run every time you do a migration. So you don't have to worry about generating, but because we've never done it before, or we didn't have it installed when we did our first migration, it didn't know, so we need to do the initial one. Now what we can do is have a look here. Inside of backend, we have an API schema. So now you can see it's declared this namespace that we've asked it to do, and then it's got a type user, and then it's defining all the types, all right? So you've got your name, it's a string, email's a string, and ID's a number. So we're getting basic types for free without having to do any work and it's from Rails, so that's cool. Now, how do we use this? So to use this, we need to actually declare it inside of our front end so that our front end knows about it. So to do that, we're gonna go into tsconfig, and then down here you have a include. So this is where it gets all the defaults, but what we wanna do is we wanna add one here. I mean, look, we could probably just format this as well, just so it's easy to read and doesn't get too long. Just chuck that there. And then what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go back one, back end, API, schema 
d.ts. Now, this is one reason why using this kind of mono, mono repo, mono repo, well, is because you, you can actually navigate back up. If we were to put these into two separate repos, it's gonna be much harder. You're gonna to have to, I actually don't even know, to be honest, I can't tell you off the top of my head how you're gonna get this. You might have to get a remote schema, which I don't know if you can, or you'd have to do some sort of job when you're running in your pipeline. But this way, it's super simple. You've got both code bases sitting next to each other. So you make changes and you can deploy them or push them up at once. And then you can run pipelines, at different pipelines to do things. But this way we can now share types, All right? So this is the one of the main reasons why I put these two together like this. Now, let's keep moving. So we're gonna wanna actually use this type definition. So let's go into source in our front end, and then we're gonna go into API, and then we're gonna go into, I believe it's the users. And what we wanna do here is we're gonna go type endpoints is equal to, and we're gonna say get users, it's a function, and it returns a promise, and it has API schema dot user, and it's an array. Now we're gonna say endpoints is of type endpoints, and that's it there. Now, if we go and jump into our app page, you can now see if we hover over, get users, we can see it's returning a promise, an API schema.user. And then what is a user? You can see down here, we have a user is an API schema.user. So if we said something like user.mobile, it's gonna say property mobile does not exist on user. So now we have basic types from our Rails API passed through town to our next. You're maintaining some sort of typing there and you can take this further. You can use, there's a few other gems out there that help with this, but this, I just wanted to show you how you can maintain types from Rails down to Next.js. So that is it. There you have it, a front end running Next.js React. So you can use all your fun things. You can use your Shad CN, you can build it how you feel, all the interactivity that you're used to, but then you can also use Rails as a very, very powerful API. You can expose that API to other clients, you can use it machine to machine, and you can then go and add JWT authentication to lock it down, add some pundit, do some policies, so it's all beautifully secure and strong. Hopefully you learned a bit there. I really like this pattern if you are building a front end in React. I sometimes struggle a little bit with Next and it's the using it for a backend and just, I guess just JavaScript in general is a little bit harder. There's a bit more clunky. I like Rails, it's very strong. It's been, it's powering, it's the best websites. And this way you kind of get the best of both worlds. So drop a comment below. Let me know what you want me to work on next. This was something that's been requested a few times. So I thought better do a video for you. Also make sure you um, check out Clipflow. We're working on a new project. It is actually a full Rails app from front to back. So I'm using view component instead. So it's actually using Rails for front and back end, which has been a quite interesting way of working. Obviously there's a lot less setup, so fewer pieces to juggle, which means you can actually move quite fast as well. Yeah, so thank you for watching and I will catch you on the next one.